Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to some of us, uh, some of the people joining in from India uh, and other parts of the world. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to all of you who have already joined. Uh, we'll give a couple of minutes for other people to join in as well as I see uh, more people coming in. Uh, but in the meantime, we will get started with uh, the uh, introductions and other items of the agenda. Let's go ahead and uh, get that going. Um, so, all right, so very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, today's webinar is Lean Business Agility and it's being conducted by Klaus Leopold, uh, whom I would assume that most of you would already know. Uh, the webinar is brought to you by Lean Ability and uh, Swift Kanban from Digite. Uh, let's get going here. So I will start with uh, some introductions and uh, we will go from there to a quick uh, introduction to Digite Swift Kanban, who is the sponsor for the webinar. And then I will hand over the uh, session to Klaus for his talk on Lean Business Agility. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A session uh, and hopefully uh, have a good discussion in that uh, time. I will also share with you a few poll questions and uh, so that we get a little understanding of uh, who our audience is today and what you're doing with uh, Agile or Lean Kanban and uh, give us a sense of, uh, you know, uh, what is your current involvement in such initiatives in your organization. Uh, before that, let me just go ahead and take care of a few housekeeping things. So uh, the webinar is being recorded and uh, we will make the recording available to you after the webinar. Uh, so no need to take uh, any notes. Um, also, uh, the uh, questions that we would do at the end of the web session, uh, uh, you can send in those questions uh, with using the Q&A box on the right side of your uh, screens. And uh, uh, we will take those questions in the order that, they, that we receive them. So with that, uh, Klaus, uh, who is managing partner at Lineability uh, and uh, in Germany, and I'm sorry, in Austria, I think. Uh, and uh, my name is Mahesh Singh. Uh, I'm the co-founder and uh, responsible for marketing at Digite. Uh, I've been with the Swift Kanban journey since the beginning of the company and the and and the and the, since the time we launched the product. Uh, just a little bit more about Klaus. Uh, Dr. Dr. Leopold is a computer scientist uh, and a Kanban pioneer. I have had the honor of knowing him since the early days, uh, since we've been involved in the Kanban journey, and it's been great to work with him uh, in, in a variety of different situations. Uh, Klaus, Klaus has won the Brickle Key Award, uh, which is uh, instituted by the Dean Kanban University uh, for his outstanding achievement and leadership. Uh, that was in 2014 in San Francisco. Uh, and of course, Klaus speaks regularly at uh, various Lean Kanban conferences. Uh, and uh, and of course, he's the author of a, a couple of books, including uh, Practical Kanban and Kanban Change Leadership. And I think he's going to talk a little bit about uh, his book as well. Before I hand over to Klaus, uh, just a uh, a little bit of an overview of digital. So we've been around since 2002 and uh, we have been a pioneer in the web-based uh, collaborative solutions for both IT as well as non-IT organizations. Uh, we're headquartered here in Cupertino, California and uh, uh, our products are used by a very large number of people around the world, as you can see. Uh, of course, Swift Kanban is our uh, flagship uh, lead Kanban product. Uh, so a, variety, a majority of our customers tend to be in software and IT. And uh, so we have a lot of capability around uh, supporting uh, uh, applications in that area. Uh, and it's very, very uh, popular in that uh, space. Of course, Kanban is being used a lot for portfolio Kanban and uh, enterprise services planning in the last couple of years. And we have a fair bit of capability around there in terms of uh, portfolio blame management, uh, hierarchy of work definition, uh, risk management, as you can see here. And then of course, uh, a lot of uh, uh, analytics and probability forecasting capabilities built into the, uh, our ESP module. Um, of course, our product is also used by a variety of other uh, functions, uh, sort of like marketing or HR, procurement, legal, just a wide variety of uh, use cases there as well. And uh, finally, of course, we have a very uh, good number of people using us for personal Kanban, whether it is uh, organizing your own work or family events or uh, uh, any other kinds of work that you might want to uh, take up on a Kanban board to keep yourself organized. Um, we have a lot of analytics capability, and that is actually one of the key things that Swift Kanban provides to help automate uh, uh, some of this work from people who are working on physical Kanban boards and, and, and want to start using an electronic tool. This is a big reason for that. 
And uh, of course, we provide a very wide range of such analytics that the Kanban method supports. Uh, and one of the reasons why, uh, one of the reasons for the popularity of Swift Kanban. Uh, finally, we have uh, a very wide range of customers, uh, and uh, you, know, you recognize some of these names. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, as you can see, we can we are used both by uh, high tech companies as well as uh, regular uh, business corporate organizations for a variety of purposes. Uh, so with that, let me, before I uh, hand over to Klaus, let me just go ahead and throw up a, uh, the poll questions that we have. And I just wanted to give you, give a quick uh, sense of where you are in your, uh, your uh, uh, Agile journey. So let's uh, go ahead and throw up the first poll. Uh, what Agile methods do you use within the organization? And if you could select uh, the methods that you use. All right, we we'll just give a couple of more seconds here and uh, then we close the poll. Great. Uh, let's go ahead and show the results here. So as you can tell, uh, of course, a majority of you use uh, both Scrum and Kanban and uh, some of you use Kanban as well. So uh, very, very uh, strong indicator of the fact that Kanban has uh, you know, become a big part of the uh, agile journey of most organizations or many organizations. Uh, and of course you have other uh, other uh, methods as well. I'm gonna go ahead and take this away and uh, throw up another couple of questions quickly and then uh, we will uh, go ahead and get, get on with the main session. So uh, which functions in your organization are implementing lean agile methods? And I, what we're curious to see is, uh, is it predominantly in IT? Is it also in uh, other parts of the organization? Uh, one of the things that happens is many many uh, organizations start with IT and software, and then from there it uh, goes on to uh, other aspects of uh, their business. Uh, both uh, uh, Scrum as well as Kanban get widely used within the organization. Okay, so let's uh, close this out and uh, let us see what is your response here. Right, so you can see that uh, seventy to eighty percent of the companies. Uh, use it in IT infrastructure and application software development, but at least 25% are using it in other business functions, including marketing, HR, finance, et cetera. Uh, there is a small percentage that is not yet using it, so, uh, so that's good. Uh, we have uh, hopefully some good uh, insights for you today to encourage you to start, uh, start using them. Uh, and the last one, uh, let me just uh, go ahead. There you go. Um, and this is something perhaps more relevant uh, for today's session as well. How do you measure the success of your business and agility initiatives? Uh, how would you consider uh, your initiatives to be successful? Is it uh, based on frequency of uh, service or product delivery that you're able to uh, launch your products more often, uh, more consistently, or is it based on your responsiveness to market, uh, just overall delivery capability, customer satisfaction? Uh, and of course, there might be others as well, but we uh, were able to come up with these we thought might be useful as well. All right, so we have a couple of, couple of more seconds and uh, we will close this out. Okay. And uh, there you go. Great. So uh, clearly, the ability to uh, to deliver often, deliver frequently, uh, deliver quickly, and deliver often is a big uh, challenge that most people address with uh, lean and agile. And uh, so, seventy percent of you are uh, you you see that as a success factor. So of course, the next big one is customer satisfaction, and clearly, it is related to uh, how quickly are you able to deliver uh, uh, products and services to your customers, and how. Uh, how much you can do that in a sustained manner uh, is a big part of customer's uh, satisfaction and clearly uh, that shows up in the port here. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this information. Uh, let me go ahead and take that away and uh, let me get back to our presentation and uh, uh, keep, there you go. And now over to Klaus. So Klaus, uh, let me uh, give you a very warm welcome again. Thank you so much for uh, doing this with us. I'm going to go ahead and make you presenter here. Thanks for introducing me and everything, and thanks for having me. So, um, 
you have been made the presenter. I think that's a good sign, right? Show my screen. <laughs> Can you see it? Yes. Looks good. Perfect. Cool. Okay, so the title, the official title of the webinar is Lean Business Agility. And here on the slide, you can see why Agile teams have nothing to do with business agility. Well, this was the subtitle of my talk, but I, I thought this sounds way more, I don't know, descriptive what's, what's going on in, in my talk. So I just decided to change the title. So why Agile teams have nothing to do with business agility? That's what I'm trying to uh, get across in the next couple of minutes. No, not a couple of minutes. It's 45-ish minutes. So, um, well, um, where do we start? Uh, I decided not to do a theoretical uh, kind of webinar. I'd like to share a story with you. I'd like to share a story of you of a company who wanted to become more agile. So, um, that's how they did it. The initial situation of this company was like, okay, that was really their main goal. They wanted to improve their time to market of their projects. Um, so the problem was that they are way too reactive on the market. So the competitors are doing something and they can only react. So they are more or less passengers and not pilots. The other thing is um, opportunities in the market, um, they are there. But uh, when they set their project up, the op opportunity is already gone. And the other thing was, okay, they wanted to prepare for the future. I think everybody of you knows these buzzwords like internet of things, digitization, all these new business models, blockchain, and so on and so on. So you can feel something, that there's something going on out there. And they were like, okay, with our time to market, um, we are, kind of history in the future. And so they were like, okay, we, we really need to change something. And what is the solution, of course? Okay, my presentation is freezing, which is not so good. Oh, okay. So where are we? Yeah, I hope it's working again. Um, so. What is the solution to all this? Of course, Agile. We want to have an Agile organization. So an Agile transformation was the, the solution to the time to market problem. And that's what they did. They started this Agile journey for roughly 600 people. So how did they do this? Well, they were like, agility is a lot about um, removing dependencies. So we need to we organize, we need to have cross-functional teams, right? So the idea is that each and every team can deliver directly to the market. You have everything on board that they are able to deliver. Good idea. The other thing is um, they wanted to um, organize their organization by product. So the idea is that one team is only working on one product. Again, that, that, that's a quite smart idea because um, what you're going to do is you're again removing dependency if you're doing something like this. And the other thing is, and I kind of like this, they were like, okay, let's not be too dogmatic. The teams can choose their favorite agile method. There are only a couple of requirements each and every team has to meet. The first requirement is visualization. I think everybody knows this when it comes to Scrum or Kanban, there's this board. And they were like, okay, each and every team needs a board. The idea is whenever someone goes to this team, they basically see what they are working on and they also see where the problems are. So not a bad idea. The other thing is they wanted to, the teams to do stand-up meetings, fast feedback loops. Yeah. So also good idea. And each and every team needs to do retrospectives. So some kind of improvement meeting. The idea behind this is um, agility is a lot about also continuous improvement. So we need to build continuous improvement somehow into the team. So each and every team needs to do these retrospectives. And one more thing, and I kind of like this because I, I'm a little bit into measurement, so I like it. <laughs> and uh, they were like, okay, each and every team, they need to do measurements. They need to um, yeah, uh, get their uh, lead time and also their throughput. Lead time is how fast can we de deliver and throughput is how many can we deliver? How much can we deliver? And yeah, so this was basically the setup of their agile transformation. 
And I think if you if you are into agile and you read just one of these uh, agile books, I'm pretty sure you're about awesome. That's really great what they are doing. I mean, it's everything in there. No matter which uh, textbook you open, that's what you're going to do. So uh, sound, yeah. So how was the transformation done? The very first thing was they set up a one and a half year transformation project. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think that that's exactly my kind of humor, right? So <laughs> we want to become agile. And the first thing which pops up in our mind is let's define a project plan and the Gantt chart with milestones and everything. But okay, let's talk about this a little bit later. So that's how they approached it. So they set up this uh, one and a half year transformation project. What was in this project plan? Well, one thing was 600 employees, they need to receive basic agile training. They were like, you know, agility is not so much about these practices. Agility is a lot about the mindset. It's very important that everybody has the right mindset. So our staff needs to have the right mindset. And if just everybody has the right mindset, everything is okay. So mindset, what they did, one day mindset training and they checked their checkbox mindset done. We think about this, if this is really working, but okay. So mindset training for 600 people. What else? They carried out the reorganization. This means in the end, you basically throw all the people up in the air and they land somewhere else in the organization and they land in cross-functional product teams. So huge reorganization. There's something wrong. I'm sorry, my presentation is lacking all the time. I'm so sorry for this, but I don't know what to do. Okay, it's working again. Okay, so basic agile training and reorganization. Then they started to implement this agility team by team, uh, which again leads to training. So they needed to train scrum masters, product owners, the campaign uh, guys to build their uh, campaign system. So this is basically two days workshops where yeah, they kind of transform to use their language, each and every team to an agile method. I don't know what's going on here. Hmm. Ah, no, it's working. Whatever this means. So in the initial phase, <laughs> I'm sorry for this. I don't know. No um, worries. Just keep going. <laughs> yeah. In the initial phase, um, the transformation was supported by 16 external coaches. That sounds quite a lot, but if you take a look at this program what they actually need to do at this plan. Um, you really have to do quite a lot of training and they need to facilitate all these retrospectives and teams and so on. I mean, we're talking about 600 people. So 16 external coaches, um, not very cheap, good, a good thing for a consulting uh, organization. Um, but yeah, uh, what else? They also built up internal coaches, 11 internal coaches were built up and um, I think that's also a quite smart idea because often it's like this when the external consultants are leaving, uh, the stuff is like, okay, now we can work normal again. But um, if you invest that much money, what we can see here, you don't want your people to work normal again. So um, yeah, so this, this was basically um, their plan. What was the situation after roughly a month? Um, they were like, okay, 80% of the teams were fully transformed. Nice language, right? <laughs> so somehow reminds me of Star Trek, the Borg, you're being assimilated. But yeah, uh, that's maybe just me. So 80% of the teams were fully transformed. What does this mean? This means that the presentation is again not working. Um, yeah, nice. I think that's the trick. Yes, perfect. So I would just restart your presentation after each and every slide and uh, then it's working. So 80% of the teams were fully transformed after 12 months. This means they were working with these boards. They were having stand-up meetings and retrospectives and they were also capturing the metrics. And what this company is also doing, they are doing um, a yearly survey. So where they ask the staff basically how they are feeling kind of. And uh, 
almost every team said that communication and collaboration improved, which is a good sign, which is a good sign. So one could th uh, think that, uh, yeah, transformation is on track, right? I mean, sounds good. They are doing all this stuff and uh, they feel good. However, there is this topic with the metrics. So can we somehow quantify this improvement? And well, um, I will show you some charts here. This is a Scrum sprint velocity chart. So that's a chart from a Scrum team. What you see on the X axis is the time and on the Y axis you have the story points. So this, this is basically a chart how much stories are they shipping for sprint kind of yeah and the expected result was to see a curve like this so in the beginning they they didn't expect uh, the teams a lot to deliver because everything is new of course so um they yeah they need to adjust to the change but then there's a steep um race here and then it flattens out a little bit but still the teams are doing retrospectives and so on. So there is a constant um, yeah, trend upwards in the stuff that, that the teams are delivering. So this was the expected result. What was the actual result? This was the actual result. So, well, they got the, the thing that they were not delivering in the beginning. Um, there's also this steep uh, increase. But however, here at this point, velocity is going down so this means the performance of, the, of this team decreased that's not a good thing to see and this is somehow representatives for almost all scrum teams there so there's 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 a campaign team and with campaign it's of course better right let's see <laughs> well uh again a uh, chart from from the team level so on the x-axis you see the time and on the y-axis you see the lead time this means how fast are these campaign teams uh, shipping stuff. The expected result was to see something like this. Lead time is going down. And you can really expect this. If you, if you only read one of these campaign case studies, it's always the same. We could half our, leave time, uh, our lead time and so on and so on. So that's at least what we want to see here. What was the actual result? The actual result was something like this it completely flattened out. So you couldn't see any, anything happening here. So this is definitely not what they expected. And um, the problem with these charts, we need to be fair. The problem with these charts is it's hard to compare. You know, they, they carried out this reorganization. So this team, the chart what we are seeing here from this team, it did not exist before. So it's quite hard to compare. So maybe this is, this is a very great result. Maybe it's a not not a good result, but we don't know because we cannot compare. However, um, there was a, a measurement in this organization which we actually could compare, and this was the time to market for their projects or initiatives. So before they started the agile journey, um, they were running projects, and now they are agile. Now they are doing initiatives. Okay, it's a slight. Slight, slight difference in, in naming, in the wording, but in the end, uh, an initiative uh, is a project. And uh, the lead time of their initiatives was going up. That's exactly the reason why they decided to um, do this agile transformation here. So the expected result was to see something like this. Of course, there is, whenever you do some reorganization in your organization, your um, performance will drop. So the lead time will go up. But then the expected result is the time to market is definitely going down. Yeah, sounds good. That's the reason why they invested these millions of euros. So what was the actual result? It looks like this. And I think this really hurts. If you invest so much money like they do, and then time to market is getting worse. It's, it's not just not improving, it's getting worse. So they were like, what the phenomenon is going on here? I mean, that's totally not what we expected. And well, this was actually the point in time where um, they approached me. So they heard me talk uh, at the conference about this local optimization versus global optimization and stuff like this. And they were like, hmm, could you please visit us and just take a look what's going on here? 
because maybe it has something to do with the stuff you're always talking at, at your conferences. And I was like, yes, sure. That's what I do for a living. So, um, yeah, I, I basically, so it, it's not a, it's not a month work or whatever I did. I basically spent, uh, spent one day uh, at their company. And what I did, I started the conversation with the teams. And the good thing is everything was visible. Each and every team, they had this visualization. So this was one requirement um, of their uh, agile transformation. Each and every team needs to have a visualization. So the good thing is you could easily start um, a conversation with the team about how they are working. And that's what I did. So this is a very simplified board on the team level. Looks similar for Scrum and Kanban teams. So basically you have the stuff you need to do, which is not committed. You have the stuff which is already committed. This is what we are working on now. And this is done. Just a very rough, uh, simplified board on a team level. So what was the thing that, that I noticed? Well, there was this area on each and every board. Each and every team, they visualized somehow external weighting. So external weighting means they couldn't um, proceed with the work on this work item here because some other team needs to deliver something to this team. I was like, okay, that's interesting. So uh, as really every team had this problem, I started to ask, okay, whom are you working for? Uh, sorry, waiting for. And um, yeah, what I did, I basically draw some kind of dependency graph. And the dependency graph looked like this. So you could really see that a lot of teams are waiting for other teams somewhere in the organization. But the question is, why is this happening? I mean, they did everything to actually remove these dependencies. Remember, they, um, they did the, the cross-functional teams. Each and every team was structured by product and so on and so on. So the expected result is that we don't see any of these dependencies. Well. Why are there still so many dependencies? Well, I think it's quite obvious in the end. Here, we're, we're talking about uh, the, the fact that one team is only working on one product. That's okay. However, multiple teams are working on one product. This means if, if you have this team here on the upper right um, side here, um, this is working on one product but there are two other teams that are also working on this product. So of course, the teams that are working on the same product, they have dependencies, right? The other thing is the products weren't completely independent. And I think almost everybody knows this. You know, if you change something in product one, you need to do a change in product two and you need to do a change in product three. So there were dependencies between the products. And the other thing is we're talking about 600 people. I personally have never ever, ever seen a company with more than 30 people without dependencies in knowledge work, right? And here we're talking about 600 people. So in the end, it's just clear. And whenever I think of dependencies, um, that pops up a picture in my mind, a picture of a keyboard. Um, let's assume we are a company and we are in the writing business. And the keyboard is our company. So let's organize our organization. We have team one, two, three, and four. Team one is only uh, pressing the um, number buttons. Team two is QWER, team three, ASDF, and so on and so on. And now there's the customer, and the customer wants us to write a laugh letter. Nice, right? So we need to think how we can deliver this laugh letter. Yeah? Here we are talking about four teams. In the reality of the other organization I'm talking about, we're talking about 600 people. This is definitely more than four teams. So in the end, you have a team for each and every key on your keyboard. You have an F team, you have an H team, you have an U team, you have an S team. Yeah. And now let's assume we optimize these teams. And let's assume it's working. We have the best F team on this planet. When they start hitting the F button, smoke is coming out of the keyboard. And the D team is international benchmark. They are the best depressors on this planet. 
So how much faster can we deliver our love letter? Well, not so much, right? So the point is when it comes to using a keyboard, which is a high form of, of dependencies, of course, when it comes to using a keyboard, it's not so important that I'm able to hit every key very, very fast. It's way more important that I press the right key at the right time. This could be even a little bit slower, but if I make sure that I hit the right key at the right, the right key at the right time, my letter will be finished much, much faster, right? So if we transfer this idea to our organizations, it's not so important that we have teams that are working very, very fast, high performing teams. I never got this concept actually. It's way more important that we make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. That's where the performance kicks in. We need to make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. So I'm definitely not smart enough to come up with something like this. There's a guy called Russell Koff and Russell Eckhoff um, said that the performance of the system is not the sum of its parts. It's the result of its interactions. So what does this mean? If you take an organization, uh, if you tear it down to the parts, you end up at the team somewhere. If you optimize the teams, you're optimizing the sum of the parts of your organization. And Russell Eckhoff says, that's not where uh, the performance is in. The performance is in, their act, uh, in the interactions between the teams. So what does this mean? If we rephrase this for agility, we could say, Agility of an organization is definitely not about having an unlimited amount of agile teams. Organizational agility is about having agile interactions between the teams. So we need to optimize the, 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 the interactions between the team. We need to have agile interactions, right? We need to make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time in an agile way, not with a project plan. And um, well, this was basically my first finding. This organization was only focused on team level agility and there was completely no management of interactions between the teams. Agility is team was their way of thinking. So this was my first finding. I have four findings and I will stay a little bit in the problem mode and then I will switch to the solution mode, okay? So first problem was no management of interactions between the, the teams. What else? Um, I kept asking teams about their boards. Um, what I tried to do is I tried to challenge the flow on this board, the process. So I was asking like, okay, so you are developing here. That's why you have this column develop on your board and then you are done. This means the customer is completely satisfied. And they were like, mm, well, not, no, not actually, because after development, there's of course integration going on. Ah, that's good information to have. So let's just put up another column on our board waiting for integration. Nice. So, but if everything's integrated, the customer is totally happy. They were like, no, of course, um, there's also acceptance testing going on. So good information to have. Let's put up waiting for acceptance. So the board was, was growing basically. Then I was like, okay, but after acceptance, the customer is completely happy and he or she can use um, the product. They were like, mm, well, no, of course we need to release it. Okay, that's, that's interesting information, right? So uh, um, the board was somehow growing. When I saw something like this, I was like, okay, and how often are you doing the integration acceptance and release? And they were like, well, integration is done on a monthly basis and acceptance and uh, releasing is done four times a year. Well, let's get back to what their initial goal was. Their initial goal was to improve time to market. I think we uncovered some levers here we could pull when it comes to improve time to market, right? Yeah, so, um, but I wasn't happy only to talk about the downstream here. I was also challenging the upstream. So I was like, okay, here's the backlog. So this means there's, there's an idea, a new product vision for a feature, whatever is coming to the uh, backlog and then you start developing it. And they were like, 
no, of course, it's not easy like this because you need to know this is only the development backlog. Ah, it's only development backlog. Good, good to know. So if there's a development backlog, maybe there's something else going on before. They were like, yes, of course, because um, of course we need to do some analysis first. Okay, so let's just, um, yeah, put it up on the board. So now you have your product backlog. So the vision goes into the product backlog of a new feature, then you analyze it and then you develop it. And they were like, hmm, no, <laughs> unfortunately not. Well, our process looks more like this. So we have a pool of new ideas. With these new ideas, we are doing some kind of triage. Those who get through the uh, triage, we are writing a rough concept. This rough concept is waiting for a steering committee. Those who are committed, um, well, we are writing a detailed concept of it, uh, which is then again waiting for approval. And then it comes to the product backlog. So in the end, the process looks more like this. Hmm. That's, again, that's good information to have, right? Um, now we can also ask how long does it take all this um, waiting for steering committee and so they were like, okay, we are doing that triage on a monthly basis. Four times a year, we are doing the, the steering committee and only twice a year, twice a year, detailed concepts are being concepts are being approved twice a year again we want to improve time to market i think we uncovered some levers here right so what was their reaction they were like develop here is develop let's do some agile don't know fairy dust here and we are so fucking agile yeah Perfect. We are the most agile company on this planet. Well, um, sorry to disappoint you. I think you were not agile. I mean, maybe this is agile software development, fair enough, but this has nothing to do with business agility, really nothing. So this company acts lame on the market like before. So nothing changed here. And this was, um, yeah my second finding which is there was totally no end-to-end -to -end management of the value creation chain they just focused on one teeny tiny bit and that was it what else this is another typical team board um what you can see on this board there are numbers and numbers are good because this is work in progress limits and we know work in progress limits they are just awesome so this means these teams, they are limiting the working process or progress. And I mean, we, we have seen before in the poll, there's quite a lot of camp and knowledge here uh, in the webinar. We know that uh, working progress limits is probably the best thing mankind has invented, besides air condition maybe. But uh, we see switching overhead is going down from our people cycle time is going down we reduce our delivery risk cost of delay is going down so i don't want to talk too much about work in progress limits we could do another webinar only on whip limits but it's just awesome and there's this one thing work in progress limits they reduce cycle time or lead time and time to market so why isn't it working so this company they were using the teams were using uh, whip limits but the cycle time or lead time of their um, project was going up. That's not what the idea of uh, whip limits is. Well, when it comes to limiting your work in, in progress, there is, well, let's call it the fine print. And I think this fine print, maybe 95% of the organization have, have never uh, read this uh, fine print of whip limits. So it's a little bit bigger here for you to read the fine print of, of whip limits is you need to limit these work items where you want to achieve the benefits of the whip limits it's not about limiting any random item in your organization you need to limit exactly these work items where i want to achieve the benefits so what does this mean this organization was working on initiatives perfect as they are agile 
they split these initiatives into epics. They split the epics into stories, and they split the stories into tasks. Or not? No, they didn't split it into tasks. Huh? That's interesting. It did work quite a lot, right? So, okay, so initiatives, epics, then they split it to stories. Yes, and now they split it to tasks. So that's what they are doing. So uh, let's get back to what this uh, organization wanted to achieve. They wanted to achieve um, a better time to market for their initiative. We just heard we need to limit this item in the organization where we want to achieve the benefits of whip limits, which is the better time to market. So if we want to improve time to market of initiatives, the point is I need to limit initiatives in my organization. It's easy like this. What did this company do? They started their, their agile journey on a team level. What is my area of influence as a team? I can limit stories and tasks. That's the problem, right? So uh, that's exactly what was going on in this organization. Teams, they limited stories and tasks, but they were still working on a thousand initiatives in parallel. So don't be, don't be surprised when you, when you don't see any improvement in time to market if you don't limit time to market elements. It's easy like this. So where do we, are we able to actually limit the initiatives, not on a team level? That's something that has to be done on a strategic portfolio management uh, or, or, or on a portfolio level, actually. And this is the thing what was completely missing in this organization. Agility was only a team level thing. And of course they had something like a portfolio, which was some, some kind of Excel spreadsheet with a, a shipload of numbers in there, but there was totally no agile strategic portfolio management in place. And they definitely did not limit the number of initiatives in the organization. And this was my third um, problem I discovered here. So one more problem, and then we quickly go to, um, to the solutions, the road to nowhere. Well, um, nice headline, right? So um, the initial goal was to improve time to market. They wanted to be proactive and be aware of the change that's going on in the market and so on and so on. So what does this company do? They build the first derivative of their initial goal. The first derivative is, okay, we want to improve time to market. That's the reason why we need to go agile, perfect. So they started this agile transformation for 600 people. But now was the question, okay, how do we become agile? So you build the second derivative. And the second derivative was, we need agile teams that are using agile methods, right? So we need scrum masters, we need product owners, we need all these guys and uh, stand-up meetings and retrospectives and so on and so on. Nice. What was the result? In this company, the result was, that the entire organization was very busy talking about stuff like, is the product owner allowed to join the retrospective? And I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> you guys, you want to improve time to market. And you are discussing about roles or you're discussing about if someone is, don't know, allowed to join the meeting according to some framework and stuff like this. And I'm like, what's going on here? You want to improve time to market. So whenever you build these derivatives, you lose the, the, the actual goal, what you want to achieve actually. So you need to focus back what you really did. And that's, that was not happening here in this organization. The other thing was, we've already talked about this a little bit. They were like, okay, our current situation is that we are an ugly square. Yeah, like this one here. But we wanted to be a shiny star. So um, how do we come from, from our current state to this desired state? Well, their answer was, we need to write a transformation plan, right? I think that's not the point. If your desired state is agility, you cannot become agile with a waterfall project plan. The point is agility already starts with the change process. And that's something that was completely missing in this organization. Yeah? So they built this uh, transformation plan. And the very first thing you could read in this transformation plan is, of course, 
we need to do a reorganization. There is always this focus on the organizational structure. So what you basically do is you move the people around in your organization and then it's working, right? So you just change the offices and uh, yeah, who's talking to whom and who's in, with, with whom in, in another team and then it's working. I think everybody has heard about the Spotify model, right? If we only have our squads and tribes and blah, blah, everything is working. I don't think this is so. So I put a link in here. This is uh, Cliff Hazel. He is uh, working with Spotify. He's the, I don't know, tribe chapter lead of agile coaches or so. Um, and I did an interview with him where he basically says, well, he basically explains the Spotify model because it's totally not about the model. So um, the point is, there is of course the organizational structure, but there is not only the organizational structure. Each and every organization hopefully has something like an operational structure. Operational structure means an idea, a vision comes into our organization, is somehow rooted through our organization, and in the end, it generated some value for our customer. So the question now is, I, as a customer, what am I interested in? Am I interested in how your organization is structured and uh, how the people are organized in teams or so? Maybe not, right? I'm only interested in the operational structure. So my point is, don't start with, with a reorganization. Focus on the operational structure. Be aware of how you are generating value for your customers and maybe you find out the way how we are generating value for our customers is not the best, then the conclusion out of it is that you probably change the organizational structure. But start with the value first, with the value delivery first, and focus on the operational structure first. And this was again completely missing in this organization. So they had a perfect waterfall-like change process for an agile uh, transition. And well, that's not a good thing in the end. So these were the four problems. And now we'll quickly go through the solutions because you will see the solutions, they are really easy. Let's start with the first one, no management of interactions between teams. So remember, this was this dependency chart here. This means um, we had a lot of dependencies between the teams. So what did we do? Well, we zoomed out a little bit. We, we, so the dependencies, the problem of the dependencies was that multiple teams were working on one product. So what we did, we basically analyzed or found out which teams are working on one product. And then we basically locked them in a room and said, okay, figure out how you guys are working together. And what they did, the teams that are working on the same product, they came up with a product board and the product board probably look something like this. So now here, um, the multiple teams are coordinating their work on the product. You can see also external weighting here on, on this board. But when we talk about external weighting here, we're talking about weighting outside of the product because all the internal dependencies, they are already uh, managed on the board. So the team dependencies are managed on this, on this board. So that's, that's a very good thing. Uh, how do we manage these dependencies? Well, I said agile interactions and the board is not the interaction. We need to set up feedback loops. That's where the interaction is taking place. This means what we did, we established stand-up meetings on a um, product basis and also retrospectives as two major parts. This means um, delegates from the teams were meeting in front of the product board. They were having a discussion. That, that, that's basically what was going on. The result is that we could remove the, the number of dependencies actually a lot. There were only these dependencies left between the products, right? Because all the dependencies within the product, they were already covered. So how, do we, um, how did we manage these uh, teams? Well, uh, sorry, these, these dependencies, the, the, the inter-product dependencies. Well, we established something what I would call an operational portfolio management. This means to build boards where 
well, first we, 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 we try to uncover what are the, the most important dependencies between the products. And for these products, we build separate boards. Here you can see there's one product in a swim lane, right? So these three products there have a lot of dependencies. So we basically build a board to see these dependencies. And again, we set up feedback loops. So we were doing these portfolio stand-up meetings um, and portfolio replenishment meetings, uh, retrospectives and replenishment meetings. So, and it worked again, uh, like, like before, um, that delegates from the, from the individual products were meeting in front of this board and they were having um, the right discussion. So that's what I uh, mean when I say that's an agile interaction, right? They were meeting twice a week or so uh, in front of this board and they were just managing their dependencies. It's easy like this. So um, this was the first uh, thing. Um, we build product boards and we build operational portfolio boards to manage the uh, dependencies. No end-to-end -end management of the value creation chain. I have only one slide for you here, but the whole process took one and a half year roughly. So uh, in the end, it's easy. What we did, we yes, um, basically went to the upstream. upstream. Remember, uh, the board I've shown you before started somewhere here, product one, product two, product three. But now the upstream is also part of this board. Remember, they had this very long process. So what we did is we somehow um, yeah, reduced the steps in this process. So currently they are only having one rough concept and this uh, rough concept is waiting for approval. So the solution looks very easy, but it's, it's really very hard to get there, especially in a company like this was where they really have a complete, complete separation between business and IT. So that's not an easy thing to do, but um, it's really worth doing it because that's really where business agility kicks in. If you get the business people um, totally on board, and getting them on board literally means that they were joining our meetings. So we were having stand-up meetings together with business, which is a very good thing. So no strategic portfolio management. Number three, I find this one actually a little bit easier than the end-to-end -end management of the value creation chain. So we basically set up a board for senior management and uh, their reports, kind of. So um, strategic portfolio means we were thinking about, okay, what, what is keeping the organization busy? And they were like, okay, in the end, we are working on features that make money and we are investing money. Investing money means we are doing stuff like there's probably no direct um, user value attached, like refactoring, automation, and so on and so on. But still we need to do it. So that's, that's some kind of investment. Then they were like, okay, we have something like a strategy. So let's make our strategy visible on the, on the board. And then we were like, okay, and how we are working on this stuff. And then something like this um, was the result. And the good thing is all these work items, they were aligned to the strategy. And the biggest lever of course here is that we limited the number of work items on this level. And that's really a huge impact that you're having in your organization when it comes to uh, reducing uh, your time to market. So that was uh, uh, strategic portfolio management, the board. And of course, you need to uh, set up feedback loops. Again, stand-up meetings is a very good thing. And on this level, you also need uh, to do something like a strategy review. So you could challenge your strategy from time to time if this is also uh, if it's still valid. Yeah, in the end, not too hard um, to achieve, but you need to have the right people on board. One more thing here, waterfall-like change process for an agile transition. And well, I think we could do a couple of webinars only on this topic, how to um, do an agile change process. Well, I've, I have only one quote for you. This quote is from Gandhi be the change that you wish to see. So if you want to become agile, your journey starts with the change process. And I think be the change that you wish to see is a very good motto um, also for any kind of leadership. So um, yeah, 
th that's everything I wanted to say um, for this part because I think it's really huge. But I think that that's some kind of true star which acts for me, uh, which, which works for me actually quite uh, quite good. So be the change that you wish to see. So yes, these are the four or these were the four problems. And if we take a look at these problems, we can definitely say that business agility is not team sport. Business agility is definitely corporate sport. You cannot achieve business agility only on a team level. But if you cannot achieve business agility only on a team level, where in your organization can you actually do something? Well, there's a model which I call the flight levels and which, um, yeah, I can show you in two minutes and uh, I think it helps me to somehow clarify where in an organization I can, I need to do something. Well, if you're flying very low, you see a lot of details, but you don't see a lot actually. And if you're flying very low in your organization, that's uh, flight level one. You see a lot of details flight on flight level one. That's the operational level. That's for the people who are doing the real work, right? Who are sitting in front of the keyboard and delivering stuff. That's the team level. Um, if uh, you can um, improve your agility on a team level, of course, and that's a good thing to do, right? So often an organization, or often, almost always, an organization doesn't have only one team, you have multiple teams. So you can do uh, something on a team level for your team. So you see multiple flight level one systems in your organization, of course. If the flight level one teams are the keys of your keyboard, you need a keyboard. And that's exactly where flight level two kicks in. On flight level two, my presentation is still, is again not working, but that's not what flight level two is about. Flight level two, here it is. That's your keyboard. On flight level two, it's about end-to-end -end coordination of the entire value creation chain. This means in the best case, this sport is like, from idea to impact. You coordinate and make sure that the right team is working on the right stuff at the right time. And that's why you also connect flight level two systems with flight level one systems. If this is one value creation chain, an organization often has more than only one value creation chain. Maybe you're working on multiple products. And if you have, multi, uh, if you have dependencies between your value creation chains like your products, you probably come up with another board, which I would call the operational portfolio management. That's again a coordination thing on flight level two. What we've also seen in uh, this talk is that you can fly even one flight level higher and that's strategic portfolio management. That's really that's um, basically you align the work, the entire work in your organization on your strategy and the biggest lever is that you are limiting your work in progress on this level in the organization. That's where the biggest lever is. So um, in larger organizations, um, it's possible to have multiple flight level three systems. But yeah, so these are the flight levels. So one thing that's important for the flight levels, I wouldn't say that flight level three is three times more, I uh, don't know, better than uh, flight level one or something like this. So it's not about better or worse. It's about um, finding out what you actually want to change. And with the flight levels, you can start a communication where in your organization is the right lever to pull. So the point is, if teams are not delivering, you can take the best strategic decisions. Teams still won't deliver. Right, so you only can solve you can solve this only on on flight level one. And on the other hand, if your problem is that your time to market of your initiatives is way too high, there's no point in doing something on the team level. You you need to do something on the on the on the portfolio level because you need to limit the number of initiatives in your organization. So it's really for me, it's just a communication model. It's not about implementing the flight levels. It's about having a conversation where in the organization we need to change what. And that's actually everything I wanted to say. So, um, yeah, as a takeaway, I would say, again, I repeat myself, but I think it's really important. Business agility is no team sport, it's corporate sport. And that's everything from my side. Thank you, guys.
Thank you, Klaus. Uh, as usual, a very, very uh, interesting and uh, and a very uh, uh, session, I would say. A uh, lot of, lot of uh, knowledge packed into that session and uh, with a lot of good humor. I really appreciate that. Um, so, folks, uh, just to let you know, the Q&A box is on the right side of your screens. Uh, send us any questions that you have. Of course, we are already sort of uh, out of time in terms of uh, the webinar time. I know that some of you might have to go, but uh, those of you who stay, uh, we will take a couple of questions at least. Uh, and so, Klaus, let me start with the first one, which I think is a great question that a lot of people will have on their minds. It comes from uh, Thomas Becker. Uh, he says, how have you convinced management to invest in support? invest in and support this change yeah. and that yeah. is i think a very common problem for uh, most organizations yes. right i think it, yeah it totally is well in this organization it wasn't too hard i mean still uh, there was some 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 point uh, where you need to convince them but uh, the biggest um, or what was easy in this organization is that there was really something like a sense of urgency so they could really see that they are falling behind their competitors in everything. So uh, the senior management was like, okay, we need to do something. And if something like this is missing, I think it's quite hard, no matter so it, no matter what, what the change actually is. But um, yeah, so sense of urgency is one thing. And uh, the other thing is, well, um, usually they are smart people. So we were really having a, a conversation about, so we, we were somehow, uh, they were lying out their problems and we were having a conversation about working progress limits and stuff like this. And then they basically mapped possible solutions that I gave them in some kind of training session or consulting workshop session uh, to their um, to their problems, so they 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 found out themselves what they needed to change. But again, uh, the most uh, important thing I think is that there's really something like a sense of urgency because if there's no you know if I don't need to change, why shall I? You know. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, a related question to that, uh, Klaus, is that. And, you know, you may, you must have seen this when you went into this organization. Um, how, how was the overall change initiative managed? Was there a separate team, like a core team that was uh, responsible for planning uh, the mm -hmm. initial agility initiative and uh, they decided to focus on the team level only? Uh, how was that uh, management done? Yeah, well, it was, so in the beginning, so, before actually I, I, I started, they really had this, this project team. So it was, it was really a team of, I think it was five people or so. And uh, so in the beginning, three people were working full time on it. And then another two people joined full time and they were just managing this, this change initiative. And in the beginning, they were really doing it with a, with a project plan. So it was really like a game chart with milestones in there. And they were like, okay, up to, I don't know, March, uh, everybody needs to receive agile training. And then in the next three months, we are doing this and that and this and that. And um, yeah, surprise, surprise. Um, reality doesn't always stick to our plans. Yeah. So uh, that's what we changed then a little bit. So we really tried to build in um, yeah, an agile way of working. So we, we basically built uh, a transition or that's again, their word, I don't like it so much. But we, we built this change board. So we really came up with a, a visualization about the topics that we are going um, to do um, in this team. So change is work, right? right. Um, we were having stand-up meetings. We were having retrospectives. So we applied all this, what we wanted to see um, from, from the organization, uh, yeah, in the change process already. Does it make sense? Yes, absolutely. And so, so you need to organize for that change. And I think, uh, as you said, yes. you manage the change itself on a, on a Kanban board or more. Uh, that, I, I suppose, exactly. is the best way to do this. Yeah. Uh, another quick, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. You need people for this because we are talking about 600 people, you know. So uh, exactly. you really need some people who are doing this somehow, somehow yeah, for a living, you know. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Excellent. Uh, there's a question from, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, Floris Daffer. Uh, and the question is, do you always start at one of the levels? For example, do you need to start at strategic mm -hmm. and work your way down? Or uh, is it uh, usually start at the team level? And how does it go? Well, um, it, whenever I have a choice, I start as high as I can. So uh, if you have the possibility to start on, on flight level three, that's the, the biggest impact you can, uh, you can basically make. Um, however, what is my reality? My reality, and I think it's really in, I don't know, 80% of the cases or so, there was an agile transformation going on at, the, at, at an organization a couple of years back. So a lot of scrum teams are running around somewhere, but initiatives are not faster. So the first thing that we are doing most of the time or is building a flight level two system. And then we are uh, going up to the uh, strategic portfolio. But uh, that's only most of the time. But whenever I can, I really try to start as high as I can. Just think of the change energy. So when you really try to actualize all your teams, um, that's quite a lot of change energy you need to invest. But uh, if you start on flight level three, this is usually something like don't your seniorish management. Well, it's only a couple of people there. And the good thing is they are hopefully limiting their initiatives in the entire organization. So you have a very big lever. And the other thing is they are agile. And that's, right. that's, that's I mean, Gandhi again, you know, be the change that you want to see. So uh, they really act as role models because often it's like this, senior management is like, okay, our organization needs to be agile, so become agile. This has nothing to do with us, but I think it has a lot to do um, with us as senior management. So whenever I can, I would start there. At the senior most level, and I, I completely agree with that. I think the change, uh... Uh, that is needed by the senior management and the second thing that is which I feel personally is very important is the core agile coordination between teams um, yes I think those are two most common reasons that I see uh, why agile initiatives might fail if they're not in place already yeah exactly and in the end it's really it, it's no rocket science so you just need to get the right people together and have a conversation about their common uh, goal and usually I mean you don't do well, Actually, I don't do large stand-up meetings because usually uh, if, if you're coordinating multiple teams, um, well, it could be, I don't know, 300 people or something like this on a flight level two. Of course, you're not doing a stand-up meeting with 300 people, but you work with delegates. So teams, they send delegates to um, another board, basically, and they, were, they are having a, a discussion about their interactions. And then they go back to, to their teams and then they're having a stand-up meeting there. So information is flowing between the flight levels. And that's really a very huge lever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. Yeah. All right. I think we are, unfortunately we are out of time, Klaus. So let's uh, let's close it out. I know that you wanted to talk about uh, the book, so I will give you another minute or so to do no, that. Not really. Not really. I just wanted to mention uh, for you guys who are um, attending the webinar there is um, a coupon for for the new book so if you want to have the book you can get it for only 990 instead of 2490 and that's just type in this url and you're good that's everything i wanted to say <laughs> perfect uh, so uh, i just want to a couple of people who have asked the question uh, the response is yes we will be sending you the uh, recording uh, to the uh, webinar in a follow-up email and uh, in case uh, you wanted to connect with us uh, i think i have uh, the contact information for all of us. Let me just uh, let me just to bring that back here. Um, and the clause, I'm going to just quickly take the. Uh, sure. All right. Uh, so, if you folks would like to connect with Klaus, uh, the uh, information is here. Uh, don't let this keep disappearing. And then uh, if you would like to uh, connect with uh, Digitize Swift Kanban and uh, explore Swift Kanban, uh, you can uh, visit our website as well. Uh, Klaus, uh, as always, such a pleasure to uh, you know, interact with you and to listen to your sessions um, and uh, uh, to, to really gain insights into how you 
manage change initiatives successfully in an organization. Thank you so much for uh, doing the webinar. Thanks for having me, Mayesh. Thank you. And uh, to all the folks who joined the uh, session today, a uh, big thank you to all of you. Thank you for the questions. I apologize that we were not able to do all the questions, but uh, we will follow up with you and uh, make sure that you have the record recordings of the webinar. And if there are questions that are unanswered, we will uh, respond to those as well. Thanks a lot. And uh, with that, uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.